You know, I get questions all the time regarding something all painters have to deal with. How to finish a painting. You know, how do you know when it's done? Rather than bouncing all over the canvas, doing this, doing that, not knowing what to do next, I can show you one simple trick that will help. Let me show you what I do. Hi, I'm Lane Johnson. Welcome to my studio. Before I show you some of my tricks, let me give you a little history. A long time ago, in a studio far, far away, I painted art for children's picture books. I did that for 15 years and got to where I was painting some very interesting subjects. These paintings were mostly painted in spread form, and there were many spreads in a book. So after months of painting, when the last painting was completed, you could see all the art on my large wall in order. How did I know they were all finished? Sometimes characters appeared throughout the book, so details had to match, and the book needed a consistent look. I needed to stop bouncing all over trying to chase down what needed to be done. So I decided to go left brain. Instead, I grabbed a notepad and went from painting to painting, examining what needed to be added or adjusted. Usually it wasn't very much. I made all the corrections page by page. By the very last painting, everything on my list was checked off. Punched off, you know, like a punch list. This same approach will work for a single painting. At the end of a painting, I sit down with a pad and some quiet time and really look. I create my punch list. There's not necessarily any perfect order, but before I just start painting, I do this. Once done, I start painting. Any last details or adjustments are completed and I might spot something else along the way, I add that to the list. So basically, when the last item is complete, when the last thing is punched off the list, I am done. This approach has been a great help to me, and I do it still to this day. Now let me show you some more tricks. Okay do is finish try to finish up this list of course i usually will find a few more in the middle of it thinking about putting some uh, some limbs that are not dark colored limbs but they're light colored limbs coming out into the dark areas that's some you see that sometimes another thing i'm looking at is possibly uh bringing this highlight across here put that down and one other thing I'll look at and see. We've got a broken down fence here. So what you might see is again, another piece of fence. And again, this might not be a dark color. It may be a light color. We'll look at various things to do with that. You might see pieces of it over there and there. So I'm gonna look at that. Sometimes when I add in notations, I'll put a question mark by it because I need to look at it. It doesn't mean I need to do it. So question mark is important. Sometimes when I'm painting, I look at the scene and wonder, what if? Here are some tricks to help you visualize a change before actually committing the brush to the canvas. I often try out ideas on my computer, but sometimes the old fashioned ways work best. For example, if you get some clear acetate, you know, clear plastic, from the office supply store, you can try out a few ideas by painting on the acetate. Then you can move it around to see the possibilities. Sometimes if I wanna look at uh, a change, a possible change, I should say, rather than, uh, than just writing it down and then doing it, uh, or just putting a question mark, you can actually take a pastel uh, stick and look at a change on the canvas because you can do a little bit of pastel on the canvas and if you don't like it you just take a paper towel and wipe it off 
but in this case, I'm going to use this little pastel. See how this looks right here. What I'm trying to do is get this to curve a little bit. And all I need to do is, even enough of that on there, to step back and look at it and see if that's going to give me what I want. And if it is, then I'll go ahead and with paint. The way this is paint right here, I'll just come back with paint and do that. Same thing as talking about the fence, you know, uh, let's talk about doing a, you know, some pieces of a fence. It would not being, you could do them in dark, but I want to see what, like a, 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 this is a simultaneous contrast, by the way. Look there, it's a dark pastel, but over here, it looks lighter. So I'm going to try this like a, And this may work or may not work. I may look at it and say, well, I don't think it needs that. And it may not. So, if it is, it'd be a subtle thing. And I don't think it's. But at least I was able to look at it and see if I really need to do it or not. So that works. Okay, in the same manner, like very often I'll wonder, should I put some limbs hanging down on this tree or, or not? And rather than committing it to it with a, a script liner, I could just do it on a piece of acetate and gauge where, do I want something out here? Maybe not, maybe something here, maybe. Here. And uh, that way you get a feel for it before actually committing to it. There's all different ways you can use acetate. It's cheap and it works. There you go. Okay, here I'm using a number four short dagger. It's an aspen. Working on this uh, this plant here is actually a, sometimes called Adam's needle, common yucca, Spanish bayonet. I just call it bear grass. And this brush is perfect for it. This particular brush, you can do lots of different things. You can do tall grass, like I'm doing here. Um, it just has lots of lots of uses. It's amazing how many different things you can do with a single brush, how many different techniques, and how many different textures. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to a true detail brush, a number one velvet touch round. Sometimes the devil really is in the detail. You know, here at the end of the painting, this is when you're adding your final details. And I talk about it all the time with students. It's like, you really, you think a, paint, a painting is so detailed. If you're looking at it on your phone, it looks super detailed. But in reality, what you're, what I paint mostly is the impression of detail. Now that's not saying I don't, at the end, add details. For example, I'm about to add some yellow flowers. That's going to be with a smaller brush. It's going to be a smaller brush, whereas, uh, the impression of detail, it's more texture than anything else. And so uh, I just want to say also that when you are painting these kind of details, you, you might need a more opaque paint. Like for instance, I'm about to add some yellow flowers to the scene. Uh, you might look at the, the kind of yellows you want to use. Uh, I would tend to pick a yellow that's more opaque than one that's transparent or semi-transparent. That way you're not battling to get an opaque uh, representation of a flower. So if you're looking at your colors, you're, I'm looking at yellows here. This is a uh, cadmium yellow light. And it has a symbol on the back of the, the tube, which tells you what it is. A, a solid square means it's opaque. So cadmium yellow light is opaque. But if you go to a primary yellow, the information on the back of that tube says that, which means it is semi-transparent. So it's not opaque and it's not transparent. But if you go to another color like this color, this is Mars yellow, transparent Mars yellow. So you're kind of going to guess it's a wide open empty square, which means it's transparent. So look at your colors, look at your which ones have marking on it. So they said it's saying semi-transparent or opaque. And so an opaque one this will work really nice here. And that's what I'm going to use to color these flowers. Now, not every flower is going to be a bright yellow color. So what I will do is take another color and that's going to tint it down, basically. So when these when these uh, colors get in the shadows, it'll change. It'll still be a yellow, 
but it'll be a completely different yellow. And all of these variations are the things that make it, you know, three-dimensional. So look at your yellows. Okay, I'm painting flowers with a number zero uh, Imperial Filbert. Just painting a lot of uh, randomized yellow flowers. I'm rubbing a number three Catalyst Angle Bright. I'm creating a glaze here of uh, ultramarine violet that is basically gonna tint down its complement, this golden color. It's gonna help this uh, robe come into the foreground, into the shadow. Glazing is a subtle technique, but it's the technique that nuances the scene. It's time to detail some cactus. I'm using a number four uh, Velvet Touch Round. The thing is about cactus, you can detail them when they're at a certain proximity to the foreground. They can be very detailed, showing the pattern of the pins and the pattern of the needles, but when you get further away, it's just not needed. Remember that road adjustment? I'm using the same brush and I'm putting it in with paint now. By testing this with the pastel first, I was able to see that yes, it needed to be changed. A good adjustment. Again, using the number four Velvet Touch Round, it's just perfect for detailing leaves. This is an important detail area since it's basically near the focal point. Uh, and it's got leading lines kind of guiding your eye down towards it. Again, I don't want any really hard contrasty colors, so I'm using muted colors. Again, these kind of additions and adjustments are the kind of things that really nuance a painting. Plus, they're fun to do. By playing with the acetate earlier, we were able to determine that, yeah, some of these things, these little details near this focal point are gonna be really nice. Doesn't They don't have to be as contrasty as we did on the acetate, so they need to be subtle. Slowly but surely, I'm checking off the items on my punch list. Uh, the secret weapon really helps you move along and finish the painting. Back to the painting. Let's get up close to this focal point again, and I'm defining this little area that just nuances the contrast and uh, really draws your eye to it. Finally getting to the clouds. What brush am I going to use? You guessed it. <laughs> Filbert. This is a number eight Imperial Filbert. It's a really nice uh, soft bristle brush. What I'm concentrating on basically is adding some final highlights. Uh, I'm using just a little bit of cadmium yellow uh, deep mixed with my titanium white to get these strong highlights. Now I'm gonna make an adjustment here. Uh, I noticed a pattern I didn't care for, so I'm gonna change it. This is an Imperial number two short filbert. Okay, let's speed this up. Wrong color. Gotta first find the right uh, color to match the background. I'm basically trying to break up this repeating pattern, make it more asymmetrical, more natural looking. I try not to do these things while I'm painting, but I don't worry about it. I'd rather just look at the end of the painting and find them there and adjust them. It is done. The title is Forgotten Road. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. As you can see, the painting is now finished. I hope you found my secret left brain technique for finishing a painting helpful for you too. By using a list, I was able to punch off the last things that needed more detail or adjusting. I showed you some of the tricks I used to see possibilities in a painting. I also showed you how subtle and useful glazing is for adjusting color temperature. In the end, when everything on my list was marked off, I knew my painting was finished. Thanks for joining me. Until next time.